the act of marriage, the act of marriage. We'll do a little, uh, a little background first before I kind of get into what I want to talk about. So on December the 13th, 2022, <clears throat> Bill H.R. 8404, the Respect for Marriage Act, became the law of the United States. Doesn't look like much, just a piece of paper. Zipped on through in one day, was reported, everybody moved on. But this particular law replaces provisions in the federal law that defined marriage as a union specifically between a man and a woman or a spouse as a person of the opposite sex. This law replaced that idea. It changed this definition of marriage with the provision that recognize any marriage between two individuals that is valid under state law. That's the new law that we live under. This law here trumps all state laws on the matter, uh, which means that states cannot enact laws that bar same-sex marriages, and states that have such laws are now invalid confirming a 2015 ruling by the Supreme Court, Obergefell versus Hodges. Again, I'm out of my depth here talking about laws, but I'm just repeating what has taken place. Now there is a provision that allows the Department of Justice to bring civil action against those who violate, meaning who disagree, interfere, fight against this law, which means that gay couples and gay groups could bring legal action against those who don't cooperate with this legislation. Now, there is also protection for religious groups and their rights under conscience of religion, which include the right not to participate or recognize or celebrate such marriages. It was the only way they could get enough votes to pass it. So that there was a caveat, there was a, a section that says, well, for religious people that don't want to do you know, same-sex weddings, okay, we won't bother them. You know. It's the law of the land, but if you're against it in your conscience, you don't have to do it. And by putting that little section in, they got enough votes to, uh, to make same-sex marriage the law of this land. My sermon this morning will articulate why as a Bible-believing Christian teacher and preacher, why I refuse to recognize, participate, or celebrate such marriages. In other words, the law that gives gay people the right to have legal same-sex marriages in all 50 states, that same law gives ministers the right to refuse to accept or perform these types of marriages and by extension, explain why they refuse to do so if they so choose. And so to this end, it would be helpful if we examined exactly what happens when the act of marriage takes place. When I say the act of marriage, I'm always, always talking about marriage between a man and a woman. So to get on more familiar ground, biblical marriage is a symbol of the highest commitment of love that can be expressed. The highest commitment of love. Monogamy for life expressed in law. That is the highest level of commitment that two human beings, a man and a woman can make. It is the highest level where a man and a woman say we love each other and they confirm that love in an act of marriage, meaning a lawful act of marriage. Now some people say, and I've heard this many times, I don't need a piece of paper to be married or to express my love and commitment. Well, it's just a piece of paper. I don't need that. I don't need a marriage license. What's that? And of course, usually this is said by those who simply choose to live together, or as they say, cohabitate. However, without a marriage license, you're just living together. 
Yeah, I mean, you're living together like married people, except you're not married. Because married people are, well, they're married. <laughs> See the difference? <laughs> Living together, even having babies together, even cohabiting for a lifetime is a version of marriage, but it is not the original, it's not the real thing. Now, in our society, cohabitation has been normalized because we are living more and more in a secular society. And we're doing that because our moral levels have been in decline in this area for several decades. In 1970, one half of 1% of couples lived together without marriage. One half of 1%. Today, upwards of 15% of all 18 to, 30, 18 to 34 year olds uh, live together without being married. It's normal. The process is we meet, we date, we live together and maybe, you know, after we've had a couple of kids and we've got a mortgage, I eh, might as well get married. You know, no, it's not. That's what's happening today. I understand that there may be reasons for this choice to simply live together instead of marrying. I, I get it. I've been around long enough to know. Things like, well, we don't have the money or it's inconvenient or family pressure or uncertainty or lack of commitment. But I'm, I'm, I'm only addressing the larger issue of marriage versus cohabitation as acceptable choices for people of faith. If you're out in the world and you don't know God and you don't care about anything, you live any way you want. I mean, you know, what am I going to say to you? But if you confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, okay, now, <laughs> now we're falling into a different type of behavior model governed by different rules. My first point here is not to confuse normalization with legitimization, which is the sanctioning of some situation or status through law. In some countries, prostitution is legal. But is it moral? Cohabitation has been normalized in the United States even given a form of legitimacy to protect children and guard against abuse. And Oklahoma, by the way, is one state that has such laws. Also, these laws regulate the division of assets in case of a breakup. You don't need a divorce if you're living together, why? Uh, because you're not married. Only married people need a divorce. But there are laws that protect children especially when people who are not married break up their home. However, even with these legal provisions, cohabitation is not marriage and not even referred to as marriage by the couple living together. This I know personally just from the years of counseling I've done with couples. They refer to each other as well, my partner or my lover or my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my fiance but they never refer to each other as my wife or my husband. Why? Because they know that that's not true, that's why. The union of a man and a woman confirmed and recognized by law or social convention has been the will of God and the standard throughout history, both biblical and secular. In, a, in an article about the history of marriage in uh, The Week, which is a digital news publication, Researchers found evidence that marriage laws and marriage rights and practices date back at least 4,300 years. 4,300 years, those are secular researchers. Of course, we know in the Bible that, I mean, marriage was practiced all the way, not all the way back, from the very beginning. The standard of a couple being together was that they were married, that goes back, you know, 6,000 plus years. That this norm, one man and one woman for life, Genesis 2, verse 18 to 25, uh, that this norm and this standard is breaking down is not a symbol of progress as some purveyors of the newest ideas spread through digital media and government and education would have you believe, but rather 
is a common symptom of a society in decline, seen in every fallen empire and society of the past. This pattern was confirmed by social anthropologist from Oxford, Dr. J.D. Unwin, in his research on 86 different societies contained in this book entitled uh, Sex and uh, Culture. This was a, a massive project and it was only summarized in this 600 page book. His basic conclusion, however, was that societies flourished socially and economically when they followed the traditional approach to sex and marriage. And he found that this was true in every single case. He studied 86 societies in every single case. This was the standard. When they maintained the traditional uh, uh, the traditional method of marriage, one man, one woman, legally bound together, when they followed that economically, socially, they moved ahead. His basic conclusion, however, was that societies flourished socially and economically when they followed this approach. However, sex practiced outside of marriage, in other words, Experiments with different models like polygamy or open marriage or sex without marriage or same sex uh, activity uh, that was normalized in society. All those types of things, uh, all of them led to the eventual, the eventual demise of that society within three generations of the start of the break with traditional values. Wow, it's a mouthful. In other words, when they moved away from traditional values, it took three generations for the society to decline and fall. We here in the United States are one generation into the break with traditional values. I'm not saying the end of the world is tomorrow. I'm just saying, according to this research, three generate, you go away from the traditional value, three generations later, your society is gone were one generation into that process. Another thing that happens when we talk about the act of marriage, the act of marriage between a man and a woman creates the union that most resembles the nature of God. You ask why, why should we do it this way? Because doing it this way enables the couple to, re, to resemble God more perfectly. There are several reasons why this is so. First of all, both God and, and a married couple have a dynamic nature, dynamic nature. For example, God is a triune deity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A married couple, traditional man and woman, a married couple are two that become one through a lifetime of sexual monogamous intimacy blessed by God. Now those who are in mere cohabitation, even if it's monogamous, they don't have God's blessing because they're in disobedience for refusing to formalize their unions legally. It's as if I just flew in from Canada and I decided to stay in the United States. I know that rarely happens, but let's just say. Uh, uh, so I'm living in the United States. I don't take out citizenship. I don't apply to you know, legalize my stay here in the United States, but I root for OU. I celebrate the 4th of July. I buy a house. I buy a truck. I fly a flag outside my house. I visit Washington on my vacations. I do what Americans do. Here's my question. Am I a citizen even if I've lived here for 25 years? The answer is no. Why? Well, first of all, I didn't formalize my stay legally. And two, when you don't formalize your union legally, even if you've been together 20 years and have children, it's still not a marriage. It's a union. There might be love and affection, 
but it's not a marriage. And speaking to the new law, same sex marriages, are they spiritually dynamic? No, why? Because one man and another man make two, not one. Like a man and a woman make one, that's why. Another way that marrieds resemble God is that they both have creative ability. God creates the world. In other words, what is seen from what is unseen. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse three, God has creative ability. Well, marrieds also have creative ability, procreative ability. They create more humanity. God has given marriage that gift. Those who cohabitate may have babies, but their union is wrought in disobedience to God. And those who are in a same sex relationship cannot procreate, period. Another similarity between marriage and God. Both are the epitome of the highest spiritual quality, which is holiness. Holiness is defined as a state which is transcendent and immeasurable and pure and separate. And so God is holy by nature because he is divine. Married people cultivate holiness through various practices which please God. For example, intimacy blessed by God is holy, holy sex. And uh, lifetime fidelity is uh, blessed by God. And self-sacrifice for the spouse is blessed by God. And accepting and fulfilling one's role within marriage is blessed by God. However, for cohabitating couples, the intimacy that they have is sinful. It's called fornication. The fidelity that they may have together has no cost. Why? Well, there's no commitment when there's no cost. And the self-sacrifice that is happening pleases the partner, but it not pleasing to God. And the role in the marriage is without context. If you're not married, it's like me. I'm celebrating the 4th of July. What a great country this is. I love America, you know, but I'm not a citizen. So I'm, I'm going through all the right motions, but there's no context to my motions. I know it's a, you know, esoteric point you're going to have to think about for a while, but it's there. And then of course, for same sex couples, if you're talking about the question of holiness, well, their intimacy is sinful, period. It's not just, let me explain. It's not, it's not um, intercourse, which is considered fornication because it's in not in the right context. It's outside of marriage. The intimacy between a same sex couple is sinful, period. There is no context in which it could be acceptable to God. He refers to it as abomination. You can't take abomination and make it something good. Fidelity and self-sacrifice may please the partner, but again, it's not pleasing to God. And the role is illegitimate altogether. Men cannot be wives. Women cannot be husbands. I don't care if you're on a national TV show and uh, you tell Oprah, uh, uh, you know, you're a woman and you're telling Oprah, uh, uh, Josephine, my husband, just because Oprah smiles and nods her head doesn't make it so. The Defense of Marriage Act legalizes a same-sex union at a higher level of man-made law, which nevertheless remains illegitimate according to God's given law, period. Just for 
verification's sake, if you're wondering, Leviticus 18.22 is just one passage, but you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Uh, you, there's no way you can twist this to make it right. And then in the New Testament, Paul says, or do you not know that the unrighteous, that's who they are, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, who are the unrighteous and what will they not inherit? The kingdom of God, that's another way of saying going to heaven. Do not be deceived. Why does he say that? Do not be deceived. Because there are people in the world that will make these things that are wrong right. So he says, don't be deceived. Don't be conned. Neither fornicators, well I already explained, fornication if you don't know, is sex outside of marriage. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, adulterers, that's married people having sex with someone that's not their partner. Nor effeminate, the trans community, nor homosexuals, well we know who they are, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And those sins, you know, they're not worse than another sin. It's a sampling. He's saying, don't be fooled. These type of things are going to be punished. Don't let anybody tell you, you know, black is white, white is black, uh-uh. So what do we do? Okay, I've explained the problem. We can stop here, but what, what do we do as Christians? It seems like all of this stuff is overwhelming. You know? It's the federal law. What are we going to do? We're going to go march in Washington you know, with signs, uh, call our congressmen or something. They already voted. <laughs> so what do we do? Most of us are pretty familiar with the information that I've given you so far. But what are we supposed to do with it? Well, here are some suggestions, especially for Christians. Number one, understand a reality that you as a believer may not like or want to admit about cohabitants or same-sex unions. Okay, they're wrong, good. But you need to understand something about these things. First of all, for those who simply live together and not married, they simply may not want to get married, period. And there may be any number of reasons. Maybe they're already married to somebody else and they can't afford a divorce. You ever think about that? Or maybe uh, they haven't got a money for a wedding, too expensive. Or they don't see the need. In other words, let's, just let, let, let's not rock the boat. Or they don't care what other people think. We're living together, we don't care what you think period. Or they have no religious convictions about it. I mean, the only way to make them want to marry is when they want to please God, usually. That's the, that's the turning point. And this is less about marriage and more about the gospel. I become a Christian. I want to do the things that please God. Well, one of the things I may have to fix in my life is that you know, I'm not married with the woman I've been living with for three years or something. And I'm going to change that, Lord. Give me a moment and I'll change it. Fine, that's good. Things that we need to understand about same-sex unions. We need to understand that their love is sincere. Did a preacher actually say that? Well, yeah. You don't think it's possible for a man to actually love another man or a woman to actually love another? Of course. I didn't say it was right, I'm just saying it's possible. We need to accept that idea. Their, their sex life is satisfying to them. They want, here's the hard one, they want what marriage offers. They want stability, they want emotional balance, they want a home, a family, a sense of belonging. Why? Because they're human beings, that's why. They have to struggle with uh, same-sex issues. Okay, we, we won't get it too far into that because this is not about that. But they have to struggle with that idea. But they're human beings and they basically want what we want out of a relationship. What they don't have 
is legitimacy with God, despite the things that they strive for in their union. I would say the same for a heterosexual man who falls in love with his friend's wife. And she, you know, you hear the thing, don't ever be ashamed of who you love. There's a country song where the guy says that, don't be ashamed of who you love. We should never, you know, never be judged for who you love. Oh yeah? What if I fall in love with your wife? You're going to be singing the same tune? You know, our love will be genuine. We love each other. Uh, it was meant to be. I wasn't happy. She wasn't happy. And look, now, together we're happy. They want to be together. They want to start a new life. They feel at home. It feels so right, it just can't be wrong. Now it takes a lot of guts for a preacher to say that while his wife is sitting watching him. <laughs> of course, the only thing missing here in this make-believe situation is legitimacy with God. What this couple may call great intimacy, God calls fornication. What they feel is so right, he calls adultery. You see, without God's approval from the Bible now, not some ultra liberal denomination, without God's approval, no union can succeed on a spiritual level if it's not legitimate in God's eyes. It's just not legitimate, no matter how many laws human beings pass. In the end, God is the one who will judge, not men. 2 Corinthians 5.10, if you doubt it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Another reality about same-sex unions, what they cannot have is by design. They cannot change or obtain what is naturally built into a marriage between a man and a woman. I mean, we shouldn't even have to be explaining this. They can't have a dynamic unity where two become one physically, emotionally, and spiritually. They can't do that. And without procreative ability, a world with only same-sex unions would become extinct. And there is no holiness possible because as we've read, God forbids homosexual practice and without holiness, we can never become like God. We can never have unity with God at His right hand. We can never be crowned with eternal life if we do not have holiness. And so both heterosexuals and those with same-sex attraction issues uh, are instructed to be chaste if they are not married. You know, some people forget about that. If you're, if you're struggling with same-sex issues, you know, and, you're, and you're not a married, you're a male or a female, and you're struggling with that, you still have to be pure sexually according to what God wants from you. And if you're a heterosexual, you know, you also have to be pure sexually before you are married. God gives us only one option that leads to holiness and satisfaction and eternal blessings, and that is monogamous lifetime marriages to an opposite sex marriage partner where both spouses are faithful to Christ right to the end. I'm not talking about what's easy. I'm not talking about what seems natural. I mean, for homosexual, it's a step of faith and trust in Christ. Homosexuals, I know many who believe in Jesus and what he's asking of them is very difficult. But you know what? There are heterosexuals who believe in Jesus and what Jesus is asking of them is very difficult as well. Not easy being a single male or a single female. 
in this society and be striving for purity day after day and struggling with loneliness and natural desire and needs. It's not easy. Whether you're a heterosexual or a homosexual, it's not easy to do what God wants you to do. So number one, let's understand the reality of this situation I'm talking about from God's perspective. What to do, number two, please let us take Romans 6.23 seriously, seriously, for the wages of sin is death. You see, if Eve could have seen the damage done by her disobedience, maybe things would have been different. Sometimes both young and old, or male and female, or gay or straight, don't fully realize that 6.23 or Romans 6.23 is literal. Experimenting with drugs or alcohol or various types of sex or other forms of sin like witchcraft or lying or stealing or violence or uh, deceptive business practices, all of these types of sin and more can change you, can ruin your life. For example, the lonely college student who tries gay sex just to see what it's like. Or the bored housewife who decides to have a fling with her neighbor's college age son. These people bring down more destruction and unwanted change than they bargained for. Why? Because the wage of sin is death and a spiritual death spiraling that most, most can't break free from once they get once they get on it. You know, my, my late Uncle Paul, everybody's dead in my family, so you know, it's all, it's all, it's all good. You know. Nobody will feel bad if I mention their name, they're all gone. So my, my late Uncle Paul uh, was one of these people in the death spiral. Uh, he was artistically talented in commercial design. He's the one who created you know, window displays for department stores. He married my mom's youngest sister, the very lovely Madeline. They had two beautiful kids. There was just one problem. He was a lifelong alcoholic. He once told me that he had his first drink when he was 15 years old, a glass of wine at a wedding. I mean, what could be the harm? We're at a wedding, it's love, it's great, it's the summer, sure, give the kid a glass of wine, why not? Well, no harm for the others, but he told me that the, the light buzz that came from the wine turned on a switch of desire for alcohol in him that never left him after that day. Many years later, when he was in his 50s, I went to see him in the hospital where he was on hospice care, dying of bone cancer, but you could see the ravages of his alcohol abuse in his face and in his eyes. I was a new Christian back then, not quite sure of what to say, so I asked him, Uncle Paul, if I, if I prayed for you, if I prayed to God to heal you today, and he did, what's the first thing you would do? And he answered that if healed on that day, he would leave the hospital in search of a drink. He actually said that. I didn't realize it then, but God was showing me a person hopelessly imprisoned by sin, awaiting its consequence, which was death, both physical and spiritual death. Brothers and sisters, God is serious about sin and its power. He's given us evidence of its destructive power. You know, in the Jewish nation, reduced by war and other calamities you know, that you're studying about in Marty's class on Sunday morning, they were reduced to a tiny remnant by the time of Jesus' appearance. And who here has not had an Uncle Paul or a sister or other family members, past or present, who underestimated sin's deadly sting and like an animal caught in a hunter's deadly trap, spent a lifetime either trying to free themselves or simply accepted their fallen state as normal? Who doesn't know a person like that? 
Brothers and sisters, I say to you again, God never lies, never. If he says that sin leads to death in all of its manifestations while we are alive, and then separation from him in the world to come, then this is the way that things are going to go. Any opinion to the contrary, any brave denials by smug dismissals of this truth you know, by famous people or supposed intellectual, they're just lies from hell to divert you there in the future. And so to summarize concerning what we need to do in a world where men marry men and women claim to be men or vice versa, accept reality that this represents a decline in our society and it's going to lead to ruin for us in the not too distant future, just like other nations who permitted these degradations of moral standards in their societies. Number two, Believe God when he says that personal sin leads to both personal, physical, and long-term spiritual death. I read it again, for the wages of sin is death. And then finally, on a note of hope, cling to the cross. Cling to the cross of Christ for salvation and the preservation of that salvation. And I would say, and the preservation of this nation Ephesians chapter uh, one, verse four, Paul says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In creating mankind with the privilege of free will, God knew ahead of time that regardless the warnings, man would choose to disobey and fall victim to sin's consequence, which is death. But there's a, a second part of that verse chapter six, verse 23b, which is equally true. And it says the following, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our task as Christians in a world that constantly changes, that continually finds ways of disobeying God and calling down his judgment upon itself, our role is to faithfully preach the gospel to the world. Since as Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also uh, to the Greek. The world has the internet and the world has government and the world has the education system but we have the power of the gospel. Amen. And believe me, the power of the gospel is greater than the power of man. Amen. Here in Choctaw, we believe the power of the gospel. And through our live and online services and through our women's ministry and through our World Bible School program and through various youth group events and through a Bible talk, of course, our teaching website, through our Bible school, you know, teaching our children, all babies, all the way to adults, we are proclaiming the freedom from the trap of sin through forgiveness and the gift of eternal life offered by the Father and obtained by the Son and preserved in this life by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, our first task is to invite and call and encourage sinners to come to the cross for salvation. Whether the world is up or very down, this is always the task of the church to raise up the cross of Christ. Don't be afraid of the decline. Don't scurry around saying, what will we do? How will we, we should stop having children because we don't want them to go into a bad, no. Don't do that, don't do that. Raise up the, Christ, uh, the cross of Christ in the church. Raise up the cross of Christ in your homes. Raise up the cross of Christ at your work. That's our task. Let the government do what it does. They're gonna do what they do. Secondly, as Christians, we need to cling to Jesus and his cross in order to find our way to the holiness of God intimacy with God, productivity for God, and wholeness before God. While others seek gratification of their flesh by sowing to the flesh, 
which will ultimately perish as all flesh perishes. Christians sow to the spirit, which leads to glory and exaltation to the right hand of God with Jesus. An eternity of existence grafted into the Godhead made possible through Christ. And all of this promise to those who not only come to the cross for forgiveness, but proclaim the power of the cross for salvation and cling to the cross faithfully for life in order to be first transformed here into the likeness of Christ, but then at the end transferred into the eternal kingdom of light with all those who waited faithfully and loved the coming of his appearance. So my question is, how are you and how far are you from the cross of Christ this morning? Do, do you need to come near confessing your sins and receiving forgiveness in the waters of baptism as so many have done in the last couple of weeks? Do you need to find your own way to proclaim the cross or help others in their ministry? Do you need to find the courage to raise up the cross of Christ in your own home? Or have you been too stubborn to let the cross change you into the person God wants you to become. Whatever your need this morning, I invite you to come closer to the cross if the cross is calling you as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that?